This is the Hofstra Radio Alumni Audio Yearbook. Today is July 8th, 2024. Please tell us your name and the years you were at Hofstra Radio. I'm Ryan Connell, and I was at Hofstra Radio from 2016 to 2019. Okay, well, thank you for joining us today. If you don't mind, can you tell us about some of the shows or uh, programs or departments you worked on? Mainly a lot of sports-related content, so anything from the locker room, the bullpen, the baseline, the batter's box, Hofstra sporting events, Long Island Duck games, New York Cosmos soccer, and especially a lot of stuff with the New York Islanders as well. Um, A bulk of my time at the station was definitely more geared towards sports. I dabbled with a little bit of stuff here and there with morning wake up call and helped out on a few news lines, but not my particular focus was mainly sports based. Okay. Did you ever work on any of the weekend shows or community volunteer programs? Uh, a little bit. Uh, we would overlap a lot in terms of game times and whatnot. So I got to know some of the community volunteers very well. Um, big shout out to Eileen and Bosch and the whole rest of the gang that did a lot to make all the opportunities for us as students really possible as well. All right. Uh, did you have any titles or positions at the station? My sophomore year of college, I was the producer of the Baseline, which is one of the college basketball talk show uh, on WRHU, which has mainly a focus on NCAA basketball and then using what the league that Hofstra's in, the CAA, to also focus on that and provide a spotlight for that on a bigger stage as well. Uh, and then I was super involved with the Islanders stuff. So that same year, I was kind of like the associate producer of the New York Islanders radio network. And then I was the lead producer um, for all the Islanders coverage my junior year, which was the 2017-18 season, which was the eighth season of New York Islanders hockey on WRHU. Wow. Just just curious, um, and I'm sure we'll get to stuff like this, but how many people were working on, on a given broadcast for the Islanders? So when I first started uh, my freshman and sophomore year, it was really contained to one studio, and it was probably about eight to ten people. You'd mm-hmm. have uh, an engineer, an update person, a producer, highlight cutter, a couple people kind of observing or learning So that right there is either about, yeah, six or seven. And then uh, my freshman year, the coverage kind of started to expand a little bit, especially once the Islanders made the playoffs a couple of times. Their game started getting picked up by bigger radio stations like CBS 880 or WFAN. So that involved then a whole second studio of people to then send some of the product to them Mm -hmm. and then keep the rest of the stuff on WRHU because they had their own commercials and different things to play. And the timing was a little bit different. So once that got into that postseason, that really kind of allowed for, yeah, my uh, sophomore year to have like more of an associate producer role. And then we went to more two studios almost full time uh, after that, as the Islanders um, started to make the playoffs more consistently, their coverage was wanted by some of the bigger stations. So then it really kind of almost evolved to tend to almost up to like 15 people on a, a given game day had some impact, uh, however small or large that may be. Wow. Wow. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, when you were on the air, did you have any nicknames or on air personas? Not really. Uh, it was always just kind of my, my full name, Ryan Connell. I mean, a lot of my friends just used my last name and, and called me Connell. Um, I feel like just there was a couple other Ryans at the station at the same mm-hmm. time. So just as a, a differentiator, it was always like, oh, that's, you know, Ryan LaFay. So then that's LaFay Connell. Like it was just like it, it was a lot easier to kind of sort things out. But I would say that was really the only uh, difference than Jews in my normal name. Understood. And I think a lot of times in sports departments or calling games that that's the default is the last name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. So let's go back to the beginning. I like to ask a two part question and answer however makes sense to you. But what first brought you to Hofstra Radio? And then if you could describe the place for the people who weren't there at the same time, like what did it look like? What did it smell like? Were there people that you remember meeting in particular? Well, I remember when I was going even through the whole college process, starting about like my sophomore year of high school, and we started touring a bunch of different places, Hofstra was either like the second or third place we went that summer. Um, And I do remember uh, Mark was our tour guide, and Mark, 
I believe it's Mark Prushing is his last name. He was a member at the radio station. Um, so when I had a lot more questions at, uh, as kind of wanting to go down the journalism path and asking about it, I feel like we got a very extensive tour on just my campus tour that I went in. Like we did a larger stop at the School of Communication and went through that a little bit more uh, in depth. And then fast forward about a year and a half or so, and I'm applying to schools. I've gotten into a handful of schools and now we're in the final process of choosing where to go. Um, And for a while, it was really between Hofstra or Ithaca, um, Mm -hmm. just for some of the stuff that they had provide. But when I went back to Ithaca for an admitted student's day, I went, it was like either February or March and I really didn't enjoy the the winter time uh, in upstate New York. Uh, It was very it was it was a little too depressing uh, for me, and I was like, "Well, I'm gonna this is like you know six months out of the year. I don't know if I could tolerate this all the time." Uh, So when we went to Hofstra a couple weeks later, we definitely made a big stop uh, after all the tours and listened to people speak of going back over. And I remember uh, vividly having a conversation with my parents and John Mullen. Um, and he was talking about all the different opportunities and how you could, how, what I wanted to do, how I could do that effectively here and kind of laying out the path for me on how to get to where I want to be as someone that wasn't even like enrolled in going to school there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just still in the decision-making process. And so when it finally came to making my college decision a couple of weeks later, I really weighed that a lot more heavily of they really have a lot of opportunities and this guy who was John has laid out this path on how I can do this. Um, So I'm sure if I reconnect with him and, you know, find a way to get involved that this might be really the best, you know, option for me for college. Uh, And so I, you know, showed up in the fall of 2015, uh, went through the whole orientation and whatnot. uh, And then there was like a sign up chance to come and sign up for the training class like at the end of before classes started at the end of the welcome week uh with orientation and i remember one of my other friends that i had met during that week uh victoria was also interested in doing the same thing and so she reminded us to oh we got to go down and sign up because somebody else um our friend michael o'rourke had you know seen her earlier that day and was like don't forget we talked about how we wanted to sign up for this and so the three of us went and i remember you know walking in and officially signing up for the training class um and made sure i got in before it filled up um because they kind of capped it off a little bit and there was definitely plenty of people that were super interested so i was fortunate enough to get in that fall the first semester while at school um and really then be able to grow from there uh and then when it comes to kind of my first thoughts of it i I just all i remember is especially through our tour on campus is just you know walking down the sidewalk and you'd make that kind of right turn to go in by the doors um right by the main office there and you could hear it coming through the speakers outside you make the walk in and you start to go past uh the main studio studio south and you look to your left and there's a whole like office full of kids just like frantically working on computers and like getting ready for what which at the time was newsline and uh whatever else because it was probably middle of the afternoon and you know there's you know there at the time bruce and john and ed ingles and pete silverman and a bunch of other people like helping out and it kind of had this kind of like wow like there's a lot going on here Mm -hmm. and as someone who was didn't really know what i was fully getting into i was like I I was quite impressed. Um, And so I was like, how do I get so I'm one of those people? Hmm. And so um, definitely through a lot of time and effort and whatever else, eventually I I became one of those people. But I remember that first time I walked in just kind of being amazed at what was going on and how much was going on. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess I guess to, to follow that up. As you were considering colleges, was was radio a main interest? And did you have an idea of what a college radio station would look like before Offshore? Not particularly. I knew I wanted to do sports broadcasting and broadcast journalism, and I didn't really know what avenue uh, that was really going to take me down. Was that like I knew I had whatever writing background, but I wasn't sure if it was going to be more TV, more radio. But one of the biggest selling points that John kept saying in his whole 
spiel to me uh, was you're not going to go to any other place where you can work with a major professional sports team and a hands-on experience and do that starting this fall. And I said, to, and I was like, this can't really be true. But the more I looked into it and the more I followed it of the relationship that WRHU and the Islanders have had, the more I realized how special and unique that was. And although I don't think necessarily radio was exactly what I had envisioned myself as like a 17 year old college or high school student, that opportunity alone was enough of a selling point to this is going to, this can help me get to where I want to be. So let's make the most of it because I don't think there is an opportunity like this anywhere else. And there isn't an opportunity like that anywhere else. Hmm. So you sign up uh, during orientation the summer before you're a freshman and, yep. and you get invited to the uh, training class. Uh, again, expectations. What were your expectations? Did, did, did you have any idea of what you were getting into? Uh, not exactly. They, uh, they, they obviously, you know, laid out how, oh, it's like this, you know, it's like this 10 week class and whatever else. And then they're like, think of it as taking like another class here at, you know, at school just with, you know, not as much work attached to it. It's only once a week and it's only, you know, a couple hours of your time, but you, you know, you have to take it seriously. And I don't think it was until I showed up at the first class and we're in a big lecture hall in Breslin hall, just across the, the sidewalk uh, from the Lawrence Herbert school of communication. And then when I looked around and realized that there's like 60 other people here, how like serious this was taking, like uh, uh, that I don't, think I truly grasped what I was walking into until then they started getting up there and presenting and going over things and me like, oh yeah, this is like, I need to know this inside and out. Like they're expecting me to, to, to basically take a full on sixth class to my course load. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of certainly what it became. Wow. So, so you are, are, are jumping in there and I, I think you said your friends, Victoria and Michael, they're there as well. Do you remember who taught the course or any other people who were involved in that? Yeah. So, uh, Bernie was the station manager. Um, his last name is escaping me. And then Diane Albanese was the personnel director. So they handled a lot of that stuff, but, uh, um, there were obviously a lot of, st um, times where, John or Bruce or others had to get up and speak. And I know uh, I, one of the most, I guess what is more memorable things is in that first class after being there for two hours, Bruce Avery gets up and gives his, you know, long spiel about, you know, this is a good opportunity. Like, you know, we expect a lot out of you and all this other stuff. And he always, the one thing he always used to say, and people kind of even like joked about how often he would say it. He always used to say how he likes to sleep nights. Mm -hmm. And so I very much remember his, him giving that spiel for the first time about how I can sleep nights as long as you don't do something that's going to like cause enough chaos to wake me up. Like I'm going to leave here when I go home for the day and I want to like go on with the rest of my life. And when I show back up to work tomorrow, I want to like leave it, you know, come to work to a place that is just as good as how I left it. And so he kind of put that responsibility on you to make sure that nothing went wrong and that things run ran smoothly and whatever else. And he, he always used to joke about uh, sleeping nights. And mm -hmm. to, to me, it was one of those things that the more I was around over the next four years, it became just like a, a funny side comment. But hearing it for the first time and like, Really knowing what he meant behind it, uh, I think went a long way of kind of setting the expectation and tone uh, during that initial training class. Hmm. So, so you go through that training class, you go through that indoctrination, and and you learn to take it seriously. Um, so, I assume you had a, a, a test to pass, and then you get on the air the first time. What do you remember about that? Yeah, so uh, going through the class as well, like obviously you did your your some of your training hours where you were behind the board and like you know observing or helping um, somebody during their shift, and you had to do both the engineering clearance to get cleared for stuff behind the board, but also the announcing clearance. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess before we talk about going on air for the first time, I'll talk a little bit about the announcing clearance, and that was a one on one uh, workshop with Ed Ingalls. Mm. Um, and so I just remember him like, you know, giving you this, whatever sheet of a bunch of different things to read and having you read it and then having him just kind of, uh, you know, look at you and like, as you're reading it, 
and you know he would stop you here and there to give a few pointers um but i remember like when it came time for like at the end of the class and going through it and just him then remembering how much you have improved over just that couple of months of i remember the first time you read this and you said it this way and now after a couple things that i showed you or told you how to do differently how much better it sounds and um to me that was one of the biggest things where i felt like i really grew a lot during that time um was a little one-on-one thing for him but then being on air for the first time it was uh sports updates for uh hofster morning wake up call and i was on the rotation that everybody was on which is you do once every couple of weeks just because we had a bunch of people in the sports department so you did you know one shift either newsline or hofster morning wake up call where you provide the sports updates um on the show and so i remember the first time i showed up i had had just a brief tutorial on how to you know pull audio cuts of stuff to include in my updates and whatever else and you know they gave a nice workshop on how to write it and whatnot, but it wasn't until the first time that I actually went live. And after I did it, did I realize, Oh wow. Like there's a lot that goes into this. Um, and so, uh, doing those sports updates once every about two weeks, um, the first time just getting my feet wet. Um, I remember there were a couple upperclassmen that hosted the show. Uh, one of which being Michael Fuller and Michael was very, what is what, I guess the word I'm looking for? He, he was very encouraging on kind of like, I know this is your first time. I'm going to help you through it on the first time. Um, and himself and Neil A. Caruso both kind of coached me through it. And we're just like, all right, like, yep, you did this. You did this. Here's what you could do different. And just like having that little bit of feedback, uh, I think went a long way in terms of, all right, like I can do this. I, 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 I have found a spot here where I can contribute uh, while I'm just getting started. Wow. That's, that's wonderful to hear the, uh, the encouragement from, from the upperclassmen and that, that sense of, of teamwork and we're putting out a good product here. It's not just, you know, figure it out on your own, but mm-hmm. I want to double back for a second. The, the, the little anecdote about working with, with Ed Ingalls from the beginning to a more polished, uh, version of your broadcasting self. Uh, was there a time when you realized not that just this guy is Ed Ingalls, but that he is Ed Ingalls. <laughs> I get I the first time I met him, like I knew he was somebody, but I didn't know who. It wasn't until like I went home after and then Googled who he was and I go, Oh, Ed Ingalls, the first guy to ever call Monday Night Football on the radio. Like I I to me it like never it never sunk in until then like the second or third time I met him. And then I realized, oh, I I'm like really talking to somebody that is somebody. Right. Um I think the first time I was just um just naive and nervous to where like I, I didn't really dawn on me until I was like, huh, I wonder more about this guy. Cause he was always talking about the different things he did and whatnot. And I was just like, Oh, let me click, let me do a little bit more research. And I was like, Oh man, like this is, this is a true like pros pro here. And someone that I couldn't learn a whole lot from. Yeah. I mean, it must be wonderful to have, uh, you know, a hall of famer on, on so many levels, a hall of fame human being, from what I understand, I didn't know him, but just sounded like a wonderful man. So it must be great to have this legend teaching you as well as, you know, these other folks helping you out on the morning show saying, Hey, we're going to help you get better. That must've been a wonderful environment to be in. Absolutely. Um, and I think it wasn't just, it's not just Ed. I mean, I think it started at the top of the time, uh, with Bruce and John. And then even as, um, Ed was not around as much as I got deeper and in, uh, deeper into my time at WRHU. Pete Silverman uh, came on as like help uh, in terms of professional and residence. And he provided a lot of great feedback as well, even uh, earlier on. And obviously Andy Gladden for all his engineering help, especially on games and things like that, where, you know, you're trying to connect to somebody off site and something's going wrong or the internet drops or whatever else, him just having a bunch of solutions. And then mm-hmm. in terms of people that were around me in the WRH community, community as fellow students, um, Mark Wiener, Connor Giblin, Matt Durant, uh, Diana Albanese, Stephanie Ruscio, Dan Hansen, Anthony Santanello, Nick Velastro, Chris Buckley, Brian Canina, Megan McGuire. Those are just a few people um, that were mainly more upper class than when I started that were extremely instrumental and helpful in terms of me feeling not only integrated um, kind of into the station, but also 
feeling comfortable that I could do the job I was assigned and giving me a lot of opportunities to do things while I was still very early on. Um, because I would say, um, yes, I had a really good time during the training class. I got it, my feet wet really good that winter and into the spring. Um, but if you told me that a year prior when I was still in high school, that a year later as the Islanders are in the playoffs, um, as an 18 year old college freshman, I'm going to serve as an associate producer for the New York Islanders radio network in a second round Stanley cup playoff game. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would have not believed you. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was, there was a lot of trust from some of those people that I mentioned, uh, that they kind of acknowledged the time and effort and whatever else I put in, uh, and put me in a position to where, yeah, it was like, Hey, we need somebody today because a couple of people are down and out. Like you're who we trust the most to do a job that maybe you wouldn't necessarily get as just a freshman, but we need someone and we really trust you. Uh, so I think that went a really a long way into helping me get started at, at WRHU. And um, a lot of those people um, I really can't thank enough, um, especially specifically a lot of the people that I, you know, some of them I haven't seen in, since I graduated truly, but um, still seeing, you know, what they're doing and how they are impacting the world now. It's, it's awesome to see that um, I'm glad that I, I, I learned a little bit from them uh, getting going. Yeah. What a great environment to be in. Um, was there a light bulb moment where you realized, uh, like you were just saying, they, they called you in as a freshman to work on the, on the playoff game, but like, was, was there a light bulb moment where you thought, okay, I can do this. I'm good at this. Or was it just a gradual acclimation process? Uh, I would say it got sped up a little quicker. Um, like, I mean, I, I knew what I wanted to do, which was to, you know, call a lot of sports games. So I was like, how can I get there? And they always talked about, oh, you got to do all the technical side stuff. Then you got to move to doing updates during the game or doing being part of the, you know, studio panel of halftime and post game and pregame and whatever else. Um, so I knocked out a lot of those roles um, deep in early into the spring. And then um, I was supposed to get, um, I got like an uh, on-site game to provide, you know, color commentary for a baseball game. Um, pretty early and then one soccer game uh, for the New York Cosmos and I was supposed to do another game with Connor Giblin who is uh, who had just taken over at sports director well he got really sick and nearly lost his voice and so he was supposed to do play-by-play and he goes I know you've only done two games but one of them uh, is is soccer specifically Cosmos and he goes and I trust you that um, he goes, I'm throwing you on play by play uh, on Sunday. Like he told me with like two or three days notice because I can't talk. Mm-hmm. So he goes, I'm going to be there with you providing color commentary as much as I can. But you're going to pretty much do this by yourself. And I that was where it was like, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Um, but uh, after some preparation and, you know, a couple of meetings uh, and kind of talking me through some stuff, uh, the game went off really well. Um, and I think I not only uh, impressed Connor, but also more importantly, impressed myself uh, and, and allowed me to develop a confidence that, yeah, I, I, I am supposed to be here doing this. And I think that only translated as the spring went along after that, uh, that it, it hit me that, yeah, I'm in I'm in the right place. Um, but I think it might have been a little quicker than some people's, you know, gotcha moment is. But mine, I think, came rather early on. It sounds like there was a lot of support and a lot of good preparation, and that ter- that training class is definitely instrumental in getting you ready for whatever comes up because you don't you don't know what's going to come up. Yeah. Um, I guess if I could go back to the beginning too, as well, was there a, a sport that you felt strongest in or were most excited to call? Always basketball. Uh, coming from Connecticut, uh, UConn basketball, like uh, my childhood was like my favorite thing. And it still is one of my favorite sports, if not my favorite sport, uh, to call and broadcast. So I knew I wanted to get heavily involved with that, uh, and I was fortunate that our time, my time at Hofstra, that uh, both the men's and win- women's basketball teams were rather successful. No NCAA tournament appearances, but a lot of deep runs in conference championships. And then by the end of my time, being able to even call a conference championship game in which Hofstra was in for men's basketball um, was a huge thing, not only to have on my resume, but also kind of a testament to 
all the time and effort that myself and a few others put in, but also being able to cover such a great team. But I would say I did a lot of different games. I called soccer, field hockey, volleyball, both basketball teams, baseball, men's lacrosse. I never did. The only sports that I think we broadcasted that I never did were women's lacrosse and wrestling. And it's because I just didn't know enough. So Mm. I did not want to put myself in a position where I was going to be uh, asked to talk on something I really didn't have strong confidence in. Um, So uh, I will say I was blessed with the opportunity to do over a hundred or close to almost 150 different on-site things throughout my time at WRHU. And that started, yeah, by the spring of my freshman year, I had already about five to 10 under my belt and it only took off after that. Wow. Amazing. Um, you mentioned a lot of names and, and a lot of people who gave you encouragement and kind words. When did you feel socially comfortable at the station? When did you realize, Oh, I'm going to hang out with these people an awful lot. So that same spring semester, uh, once I kind of was into the station full time, uh, and started doing, working more games, just being around that many people, um, for games or whatever else and soaking things up, you kind of got invited to, you know, hang out with, uh, them outside of that too, whether it was grab dinner with someone or go out somewhere with somebody to do something else. Um, and then in between classes started hanging around, just the station more of knowing, Hey, most of my classes are in, you know, either this building, the building across the sidewalk or somewhere right on the quad here. Like, let me go grab my lunch. Cause I have an hour and a half, uh, and go sit down and do a little bit of work, but also, you know, socialize with what, you know, a group of people that became some of my better friends. And so once I started to show up more, um, and kind of hanging around the main office in the conference room, then I was, I would say almost fully integrated into the social circle of not just the sports department, but just other people across the station. And that became then a lot of the different friends and people I knew throughout my time uh, uh, at Hofstra in general. Mm. I I want to call back for a moment. You mentioned Eileen Cronin and and Basha and and being there on the weekends for a lot of games and so forth. How did the community volunteers help create a, a, a sense of, uh, you know, social integration that, that everybody was getting along and helping each other out. I mean, though their marathons that they do to raise money, mm-hmm. um, you get to get a full experience of not only who they are, but they also get to know more about you because yes, it's one thing to come and, you know, sometimes help out their sh- at, uh, with their show for an hour or two um, here or there. But those times when they are, helping you indirectly and directly because a lot of the money and other stuff they raised paid for trips for us to go places and do a lot of things. So to be there and spend time with them in that regard to give what, you know, just my time just to be around them and to, to thank them for what they do to make our opportunities um, the best they can be was awesome. Uh, and when every time they had a marathon or whatever, it was like, you're going to be there. There's going to be some great food. You're going to talk to whoever's there. Um, and they always have, they always had guests, uh, for things like that. They, whether it was family or friends or whatever else. So you would hear different stories and just get to see more of them in a personable light. Um, not just someone that comes Uh, to the station and does their show, you get to see them and their true element and what they really enjoy doing. And to see that um, and to see how um, what they created was also helpful to us uh, as students, I think was a really great balance uh, and something that was really unique and special to Mm WRHU. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, This next question, I, I think you've answered already, but I like to ask it to sort of sum things up with with a little bit of hindsight um can you go back to your mindset at at 18 years old at entering Hofstra radio knowing you want to do something with sports broadcasting what was your mindset what what did you hope at that point Hofstra radio would be and what did it become for you yeah I I thought Hofstra radio would become a place where I could get the experience doing what I wanted to do which was as you mentioned calling sports games uh I didn't know then at the magnitude or the stakes that it would um it had give i i figured it would give me a place where 
uh, it was an avenue to develop and start to chase after a, I, you know, a dream that I had created for myself, but I didn't know how many doors it would truly open until I got there. Um, so I think as a young, younger member of the station, just getting into the station, I think it was just like, all right, I'm in a spot where I can start to do what I want to do. And, um, but I don't think I really know how much it was going to help me later until I got deeper into my time there. And then just how many extra doors and opportunities, internships, people you meet and all that other stuff that comes with it. That came later as an 18 year old kid. I wasn't thinking about that. I was just thinking about how could I go to a place where I can call sports games or talk about sports. That's just what I wanted to do. And that was an outlet for me uh, in a way that was already available. Um, and then I think as my time went along, then that developed into something greater. And now looking back on it, you know, five years, even removed from graduation, just how much, um, that place has meant to me and what it did for kind of shaping, um, some of those formative years. But in the early days, it was just like, all right, this is a place where I can come and, you know, start chasing the dream, little, not knowing what it would eventually unfold. Mm -hmm. Ryan, that, that is great. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and, and taking the time. Um, I've got so many more questions and I have a feeling we've got a lot more stories to cover. I, I hope we can talk again sometime. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. It's always great to talk about Hofstra Radio and WRHU and uh, the great impact that it had not only on my college experience, but countless others. And um, the least I could do is you know share some of those stories and what makes that place so special to me. Uh, and I hope other people can uh, do the same.